Hey, thanks for tuning into the Long Grade Lesson Show. It's a podcast that motivates and inspires leaders to pursue their passions and to leave a positive impact in their communities. Lindsay graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 2014 and branched aviation. During her time at West Point, she majored in American politics. She was the captain of the Army Women's Track and Field Team, where she competed in the pentathlon, heptathlon, and 400-meter hurdles in the Patriot League. Before her senior year, she was named brigade commander and first captain for the 2013-2014 academic year, and only the fourth female to hold this position in the history of the academy. Upon graduation from West Point, Lindsay attended flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama, where she chose to fly the AH-64 Apache helicopter. During her time in 36 Cav, Lindsay assessed for the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, where she assessed favorably to fly the AH-6 Little Bird. Lindsay is the first female in SOAR history to fly the AH-6 Little Bird and is currently serving as a platoon leader for the organization. Welcome, Lindsay Danilak. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. It's really awesome to be here. How does it feel to be back here at the Academy for Branch Week? Um, when I was a cadet, I, especially my first year, I remember seeing the Apache come and land on the plane. And I first off, I really wanted to branch aviation. And then second off, I was like, wow, it'd be so cool to come back and be able to to actually be flying that helicopter and land it on the plane. And unfortunately, I didn't get to fly the, the Apache in uh, this week, but it was it, it's so it's so incredible to be back to West Point, especially for Branch Week, being able to see all the cadets um, from plebe all the way up to first seed, just be so interested in all the branches that the Army has to offer. Um, and just in general, it's it's a beautiful day, finally, for the, like, the first time this yeah, week. The it's been raining, out. right? I know, it's, it's been kind of ugly out, but um, so finally we have a beautiful West Point day. It's It's awesome. That's phenomenal, and I'm so glad that you're having a great time back here. I know it's probably bringing back a lot of nostalgic memories, <laughs> and there's probably some changes, but um, it's good to have you back here at Thank the academy. You. It's been six years, right? Yeah, six years. Six years since uh, graduation. Wow. Yeah. That that is that is incredible. Um, I know we also had your five year just last year here. Yep. Mm-hmm. Time flies. Time <laughs> it flies. Really does. Yeah, that mine's coming up uh, next year here. So, um, but. Uh, I would love to kind of re- rewind the clock a little bit and kind of go towards the origins of your story Okay. and uh, what happened prior to West Point. Um, if you could tell the audience a little bit kind of about your, your upbringing and your, your childhood. Yeah, definitely. So um, I grew up in one location my entire life in Montville, New Jersey. Mm. So luckily for me, it's only an hour. It's yeah, only an hour it's away down from the road. Here. Down the road, right. And um, I have no military background in my family. So um, my dad currently is a teacher. My mom works in pharmaceuticals. So honestly, just had no um, like history of the military to kind of influence me and make that decision of, to go to West Point. But um, growing up, I love to be outside. Honestly, my brothers and I, there wasn't a single day where we weren't outside, especially during the summer. My parents would have to call us back to come inside to eat dinner because we would have just stayed outside until the sun came up if if we had that choice to um and we rode dirt bikes and built tree forts and just and just loved being outside so i think kind of uh being raised especially with two brothers and then a lot of uh, all of our friends were just guys that lived down the street we ride bikes together just kind of being raised in that environment um i guess like motivated me to kind of want to i was very interested in the military when I was, I want to say like 10 or 11, uh, my dad took us on a trip to up to West Point. And we were just going to have a, a family picnic. Just he, he loves uh, the history of the country and we always go to historical, to historical sites and national parks and everything. He just likes to, to teach us about the history of the country. So, of course, the, one of the best places to go is to West Point. And I remember sitting um, at Trophy Point, having lunch with my family and looking around. And it was it was during the summer. So the cadets were were doing cadet basic training. Mm-hmm. They were actually doing combatives out in Daly yeah. Field. And I was like, I can't believe this is a college. They get to wear uniforms to class. I couldn't believe it. And, and my dad didn't know too much about the school at that time. So we started doing a little bit more research. And um, since that point on, West Point was the only school that I wanted to go to wow. in uh, in high school. 
I remember telling all my teachers, like even as a freshman, I'm gonna go to West Point, like after high school, I wanna go to West Point. And I had a few teachers actually tell me, "Mm -mm, there's no way you're gonna get into that school. (laughs) So um, it motivated me even more. I was the first person from my high school ever to go to West Point too. So my guidance counselor, even from being so close, like you would not think that it was, I would be the first person, but my guidance counselor had no idea how to apply. My dad and I did the entire thing ourselves. Um, got the congressional nomination from Raleigh Friesenhe- Freelandheisen and um, just did it all on our own because there was not much support, I guess, from the mm-hmm. from the school, just simply because they had, didn't know um, how to how to make that process work. Because you know how it is. It's so, yeah. it's very rigorous trying very to get tedious. yourself in, into West Point. So, yeah, um, West Point was the only school I applied to. That's the only school that you applied the to. The only school I applied to. I so you're had all in. No backup. <laughs> I was all in 100%. Um, just had my sights set really on on coming here. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into at the time. Wow. So you did mention that your dad did help you on the application. Yep. So it sounded like your family did support you from not having any prior military experience or history Mm -hmm. uh, to serve the military and also to attend West Point. Yeah, definitely. Um, Both of my parents were incredibly supportive. I mean, I can understand how, you know, some mothers would be like a little timid, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, sending their daughter off to the military academy all alone and and afraid, I guess. Um, But no, honestly, my parents could not have been more supportive of my desire to go there, especially from such a young age, they, they encouraged it highly. That's incredible. And you did mention that you're the first person from your high school to attend West Point. Yes. So I, I'm assuming there wasn't a lot of other people to talk about West Point with. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like, do you experience any other kind of maybe obstacles in the application process of just trying to learn more about it or talk with more people about it? Yeah. Um. So... Honestly, I got pretty lucky because I was also being recruited for track. So I did have um, coach Joe Rogers. He was the track coach at the time that I could ask a lot of questions to because I I honestly didn't a lot of acronyms, right? right. Coming from the civilian world to to the army world, there I didn't know what half of the acronyms meant and neither obviously did my parents. So we had we had a lot of questions in regards to that process, but um, did get did get a decent amount of help from the track coach, which uh, it was a blessing, definitely. Yeah, that mm-hmm. that is good to have that resource and somebody to kind of help you learn more about the academy. Yeah. So fast forward, you get accepted into West Point. Mm-hmm. One, how did that feel? That just getting that appointment because I know that was your dream for a long time. Yeah. Um. I remember when I fir- when I got the app or not the application, the acceptance booklet in the mail. Yeah. Um. I was actually in chemistry class and my mom called me. She called me like three times and I was like, Why is she calling me so many times? And she was at home and she had received it and opened it. And uh, so I went to the bathroom, called her back, and I just I remember like yelling in the bathroom like I was so excited about it. And uh, so finished my day at school, went home, and had like a little mini celebration. It was it was a very exciting time of my life for sure because it was just something that I'd been working for mm-hmm. for quite some time. Um, and like I said before, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So <laughs> this is kind of an embarrassing story, but it's a little funny now thinking back to it. Before I had left for cadet basic training, like the night before, especially for me, because we were just driving up the next day to drop me off, all my friends came over and (laughs) I was like signing, (laughs) this is, I was like signing like clothes and like and like uh, pieces of paper and everything because in in our minds, just coming from complete civilian world, sure. they were like, "Oh, we're never gonna see you again." <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, cadet basic training is only like you know a few months or so, and then you have a day, you come back home. <laughs> but it, in our minds, it was I'm going off and I'm never coming back, and it was really nice to meet see you guys. <laughs> That's so funny, but they're like so supportive. Oh, everyone was a hundred percent. Wow, I I also did read that you. You graduated, and then only a few days later, that's when you started cadet basic training. Did you have any time in between to kind of prep? Uh, so I was prepping while I was in school, okay. um, in in high school. So I was, uh, I mean, I was still on the track team, so I was running a lot. I was, I was making sure that I was staying in, in excellent shape because I know that that was one of the things, especially during Beast, that you had to stay on top of. Um, other than that, I guess just the physicalness was the number one thing that I was working towards. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I did. I. Because I guess in New Jersey they graduate really late from high school in, in the end of June and we start we start beasts like 
also the end of June. That's right. So during that year. So yeah, it was like a three day turnaround where graduation happened from high school and then went straight up to West Point. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so you were already like showing up with your boots and your backpack and everything yep. for our day. Yes. Do you, do you, how was your beast experience for you? I was a very timid new cadet. Um, I was, I was very enthralled by everything that was going on and I was, I was very confused as well. Like I, I didn't understand how the core was broken down or even how cadet basic training was broken down. I mean, I didn't even know what a first sergeant was, like what my company commander even meant. I, I just didn't really understand that structure, that yeah. organizational structure of, of how it was broken down. So to me, I just kind of was trying to be a sponge, trying to learn as much as possible and just keep my head down and do all the things that new cadets are supposed to do. But I was definitely a very, very timid new cadet. <laughs> That's that's very interesting to hear the developmental journey mm-hmm. through the four years. Yeah, I definitely gained a lot of confidence through through West Point. So I guess with that, um, you continue to go through West Point. You were the track um, captain. Yes. For all four years. No. Oh, for- um. So yeah, we were uh, we do uh, naming of track captain the end of um, your cow year. That's right. Okay. So that you are the captain for your senior year. Okay. Yep. So, but you were on the track team for all four years. I was. Yes. Okay. And um, what uh, sports did you participate in in track? Um. So in track, I ran the pentathlon the heptathlon and the 400 meter hurdles. Okay. So a little bit of everything. I was good at, I wasn't really specifically good at one particular event, but yeah. I was decent enough at all of the field events as well as some of the sprinting events and hurdles that I, I did pretty well in the uh, multi-sport, multi-event. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. So always been very active physically. Yes. Um, how did you, I guess, manage to, um, kind of balance your time because I know already as a D1 athlete, you Mm -hmm. already have a lot on your plate uh, versus just the average cadet. You still have a pretty high workload, uh, Mm -hmm. but you have a lot more on top of that. Yeah. So what were, I guess, what were some things that you did to kind of balance everything around? Um, So I know what a lot of instructors and coaches will tell you is the busier you are, the more proactive you are, and you're able to prioritize your work the best. So I think I got into a really good rhythm of prioritizing what I needed to get done. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stay at practice extra time afterwards just to hang out. I was, I was very academically driven. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess just, I, I always wanted to study. I always wanted to do really well academically here at West Point. So Every free moment I had, I would either be in the library or come back down to Thayer um, to keep myself isolated from, you know, some of the nonsense that goes on in the barracks to study as much as possible and to get my work done. If I had an off period um, or an off hour in between classes, I would be doing my homework. I would try and get ahead. Um, If not ahead, just stay on top of everything as much as possible. So track definitely, I think it actually helped me be able to prioritize what I needed to get done um, and gave me that that like set time to work out, but then also know as soon as it's done, you Mm got to go back to go back to your studies. And that's especially important as um, senior year. You were named the first captain of your entire class, uh, which is the cadet of the entire brigade. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we mentioned that you were the fourth female to have had that position in West Point history. Yeah. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, it was it was it was shocking to me, to me for sure. Um, kind of how that all played out. Um, so I was named captain of the track team, which was a goal of mine. It was, I mean, I was very excited to to have been chosen by the women on the team to represent them and to be the captain. Um, and along during that time period when all that was happening, it was like the end, like the spring semester of cow year. Mm-hmm. My TAC NCO comes up to me and he says, you should try, you should try out for some key summer leader positions. And I, I just really wasn't interested in it at the time. I was like, well, I'm going to be captain of the track team next year. I want to, you know, put all my focus into that and uh, and be there for my team as much as possible. And he's like, yeah, but you're you're good at this military stuff. Like, you should just go for it and just kind of see where it plays out. Maybe you'll get a fun leadership role over the summer. You never know. So, okay, I I go to or to the to the boards and whatnot, and. I make it all the way up to, I guess, the the brigade level board, and I'm incredibly intimidated at that point. You know, we're sitting in like the board process, and um, I think the president of the board was the commandant at the time. 
Um, so very nervous, but must have done well on the board and uh, was named the Beast One Commander for, for Beast that summer. Was very excited about all of that. I mean, I had gone into this whole process being maybe I'll be a company commander or sure. you know something along those <laughs> lines, and then they they said, yeah, you're going to come back and you're going to be the Beast One commander. So I was I was quite excited. <laughs> so typically they'll choose that summer um, who will fill that academic year long position. Uh, yeah, for the most part. So okay. honestly, the entire summer process it, for the upperclassmen cadets is also. Um, a selection process mm. for the for the chain of command. So you have the Beast One Commander, you have the Beast Two Commander, you have the Buckner Commander, um, and how how you perform during during that time is really how they I guess decide who the first captain is going to be. So it was wow. yeah. So coming in as a timid individual and not knowing too much about military yeah, history. Shocking, right? <laughs> You now take on the entire brigade. Yeah. Um, I guess what was going through your mind at that time? I had a lot to learn really quickly, <laughs> for <laughs> sure. Um, I I always like prided myself on you know having a nice uniform and being well spoken. I guess in front of my instructors and whatnot. But as soon as they said, "Oh, you're going to be the first captain," and starting with, "You're going to be the Beast One Commander." My biggest thing was I have to talk in front of a lot of people all the time. So I'm not. I was I was timid. I was nervous about you know all the public speaking that that it required. But I guess one of the the main things that I'm very thankful for is I'm now much more comfortable speaking in front of large groups. Um, I mean I would give briefs in front of the whole core of four thousand cadets at a time. So thinking back to it, you know I don't know if I'd want to do it again, but it definitely was a uh, an eye opening experience and and a really good learning experience for for myself and for my confidence throughout, like to push myself through my military career. As, as first captain, um, I know you get a lot of, uh, pretty big engagements. Mm -hmm. So I know that you met with, um, honorable Madeline Albright. I did. Yes. Um, you had lunch with Chelsea Clinton. I did. <laughs> you also got to shake hands with president Obama. I did. How, how were all those experiences, I guess, um, at the time for you? Um, like, how did it feel? It was very humbling, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, every Before I would go with these key leader engagements and meet these, I mean, incredible people who have done incredible things throughout their lives. I mean, the president of the United States, not everyone gets to, gets to meet the president. Um, I would do a little bit of research on them so that I could be able to talk intelligently um, in regards to, you know, who they were, what they stood for, what their policies were. And it was... I mean, I keep saying it was an excellent experience, but it really was very developmental for myself. And it was one of those um, experiences where just once in a lifetime, you know, like that that year of my life, I'll never be able to redo. I'll never be able to get those experiences back. Um, for, like I had, I got a kiss from Mayor Bloomberg on the stage in Rabat in front of my entire class. I was like, this, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things where, um, you get to meet some incredible people and, and get to really listen to their stories. You know, I, I had a very unique experience and I was able to sit one on one with Medal of Honor winners with, you know, uh, Paul Buddy Buca, who is just an absolute inspirational individual um, and just be able to like sit there and listen to their stories, you know, face to face. It's incredibly inspiring and motivating and uh, very like lucky for that experience. So with all those highlights as the first captain, I would I would presume that there is also a lot of pressure. Mm, definitely. In terms of because um, essentially you're you're the face of the core. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the standards set by you is going to be a precedent for the, re the rest of the core. Definitely. Um, how was it for you in terms of that regard? So it I mean, it's it's not all glory, you know. The job definitely is incredibly stressful, and there there were a lot of instances where I mean I had to seek out advice from not just you know army officers but from my peers because I didn't peer leadership is a very hard thing, especially in the cadet world, and the cadets now um, definitely understand that because you're leading people who are your same age who may have done more than you have in in prior military service um, and who are probably definitely more like smarter than than I am so it's it's challenging to you know inspire them and, and lead I guess um, in a sense simply because 
who am I to say that, like, I, why am I in charge of, of them when we're all basically the same, you know? Um, so that aspect, that peer leadership aspect was definitely challenging. So that same year, you also implemented CASHA, right? Yes. That's against sexual assault, harassment, and harassment. Yes. Um, actually, my my roommate um, at the time, my first year, there's everyone always thinks the first captain has their own room. I had a roommate. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she was actually the... Um, the, the, I guess, spearhead behind that program. And I thought it was an absolute fantastic program. So yeah, both her and I tackled that for sure. It turned into, um, through after we had graduated, it continued, which was mm -hmm. excellent to see. So I think even still today, I still mm -hmm. see some, some of the, uh, cash of reps and everything. Yeah. So leaving a legacy. Yes. I, Good. I, I love it. You mentioned your political science, political science major. Yes. American politics. I'm American sorry. politics. Yes. American politics major. Um, so also during your senior year, um, I, I I watched an interview that you're in. You said that this is right after branching aviation. Okay. You said you hope to fly Apaches and potentially serve in the 160th SOAR regiment. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I honestly don't. <laughs> nice. But that was six years ago. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess fast forward to after graduation, mm -hmm. you you commissioned as an army officer and you got orders to go down to Fort Rucker, Alabama to start flight school. Yes. How was, how was that experience for you? Flight school was fantastic. Every aviator will attest to that. Um, you're coming out of West Point for the first time. You, no one's telling you when to go to bed. No one's telling you what to eat. No one's forcing you to do PT. Um, so it's a very freeing experience. Uh, and you also get to fly helicopters every day. So for me, I, I loved it. I, I really enjoyed my, my time at Fort Rucker. I was there for two years. Um, I ran into a little bit of an issue. My eardrum ruptured mm. while I was in the instrument phase of, of primary. Oh, man. And so it set me back a little bit. Thankfully, I had full recovery. Somehow, it ended up being that my hearing got better in that ear. I don't know how that's possible, wow. but um, so it set me back a little bit. So I was in flight school for two years, um, but was able to choose Apaches, which was my, I was telling all my peers in flight school, I was like, if I, I made sure that everyone knew how badly I wanted to fly that helicopter. I mean, I, I was telling people, I will quit aviation if I don't get to fly anything besides the Apache. <laughs> it was the only aircraft that I had a sincere passion and like drive towards that I wanted to fly. Can, can I ask what inspired you to one, go aviation? Mm -hmm. And then two, why are you so passionate about the Apaches? Um, so to the, towards the first question, um, I really wanted aviation. So my year group, 2014, we were not allowed to branch infantry um, or any of those other combat arms that na that now are available to the female cadets. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I would have branched infantry, but um, aviation definitely was, I, I liked the military aspect of it, you know, so I, I didn't really want to, for me personally, I didn't want to do um, quartermasters or, or anything in that regard, just simply because I kind of wanted to be in the fight as much as I possibly could. I wanted to affect the fight sure. as much as I possibly could. And I think, so aviation definitely set that, set that standard for me. Mm -hmm. And then the Apache is where I thought I could most affect the fight. So I wanted to be there for for the ground force. I wanted to be that calm voice in the sky for, you know, if something was going down on the ground. It just the mission set really and the the ability to support that ground force commander was was really what motivated me to, to want to fly the Apache. Wow. I guess personally, um did you ever have any sense of hesitation that this is very dangerous? Or did your family feel that way at all? Or I think I think my family did a little bit. They they really were excited for aviation, mm -hmm. um, but then when I said I wanted to fly the Apache, they were like, "Okay, that's <laughs> interesting." Like they, I guess that's kind of where the the whole thing started. Where they were like, "Well, we're just gonna let you do you." <laughs> like at this point, you know, you just keep, you just keep driving on because you just seem to keep wanting to do the next best thing, and. Um, so they they were supportive of it, but yeah, I mean it is a, it's a dangerous aircraft to fly mm -hmm. for sure. But all all the aircraft are, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing that really sets apart one aircraft from from another in terms of dangerous missions because all of them can be put into into sticky situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're at flight school. You finish after two years. You end up going to three six Cav mm -hmm. at Bliss. Yes. 
And how was that experience for you? I think I had a very lucky um, first PCS and first unit experience. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of uh, my classmates and people that were a year or two ahead of me didn't necessarily have the greatest first experience. And a lot of it comes down to your first company commander mm-hmm. and your command team that that you're working for. 3-6 Cav, when I was there, it was, we were rock stars, honestly. It was, my commander was amazing. He was such an inspirational leader. He put me on the, he forced me to fly twice, a, minimum twice a week. And as a platoon leader, sometimes that's, that's not always the case, but, um, he had just, he was a, an excellent pilot with multiple combat deployments. So he, he came into the organization and, and really motivated me and made me fly as much as possible. Like he would take me out and we would do some, some stuff that my IP wouldn't, he wouldn't even do with me. Um, and then in addition to that, my my command team as well was just stellar. Honestly, we got, we got very lucky. So we actually had this, which it seems to be quite rare in aviation. Um, our brigade commander implemented this policy where it was a minimum of, I might get this wrong, but a minimum of 500 flight hours um, for the battalion. I want to say it was per month, but that doesn't seem correct. But somewhere around, somewhere, some exponentially large number of flight hours that we were required to fly. Mm-hmm. And it was it was great because a lot of the notion uh, in regards to aviation, especially um, what the cadets are talking about today, is you don't really fly. You might get put on staff. And as soon as you pin captain, you don't fly as much. But definitely not the case at Fort Bliss. Plus the um, environment that we got to operate in was awesome. So we were high altitude. It's hot down there in uh, El, Paso, El Paso, Texas. So we got to train in, in those in those tough environments. So really, definitely created a very solid foundation for my first unit, and then my first time actually flying the Apache, not in flight school. Wow. So very the training is very realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, I had read that you also went out to NTC. Yep. And you were awarded uh, an achievement out there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how that happened. I think, I, yeah, it was, I guess, the hero of the battle. I was just a platoon leader. And uh, if anyone that knows me, I'm pretty motivated, especially when it comes to being in the field. So, I mean, we were just planning missions and flying all the time and, and really seeking out op- uh, opportunities to go and support, like, the infantry unit that was out there. So we were we were a very highly motivated company d- during that NTC rotation. I love it. Yeah. Um, so that's, what is that, five weeks out there, four weeks uh, out in the box? Yeah, four weeks. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you were a platoon leader. Mm-hmm. Um, you were also an assistant to S3. Um, what were kind of like your day-to-day activities, um, or life in, uh, 36 Cav? So we, like I said before, we flew a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, when we weren't flying, Mm -hmm. uh, I was in charge of making the flight schedule for the company. Um, in addition to that, I would help my commander with, you know, training meeting slides and ensuring that, you know, all of our statistics were were up to par with what they wanted. We did arms inspections, which were pretty brutal for anyone that knows what an arms inspection is. It's a very tedious inspection that higher comes down and really dives into all of your tactics and your uh, techniques and your SOPs and everything. Um, and a lot of the times, too, it was just working with the crew chiefs down in the crew shack, making sure, you know, that, that they were staying physically fit, um, that they were, you know, getting their job done. But also one of my main things, as well as what one of my commander's main things was ensuring that we had adequate time off. So what we did was we had, um, all of the, um, cadets, not, sorry, not cadets, all of the soldiers on an index card, Mm -hmm. write down their anniversary, their birthday, their children's birthdays, and then I put it on my calendar. And the day before one of those events happened, I said, "Do not come into work tomorrow." Awesome. And that was that was pretty. Um, they they seemed to like that because there's often times where your your train of command isn't really taking care of that family aspect. So it was it was good to see that it was making a positive effect. That's 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 great. And and you're very right that um, when the op tempo is high, it's mm-hmm. very easy to just go go go. Right. And, and really neglect the the personal stuff. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like uh, within that year when it was just go, go, go for work, did that take a toll on you at all, like personally? Not, for me, I don't think so. I, I like that kind of, that, mm-hmm. that kind of lifestyle. If 
if I'm not stressed out and busy, then I, I don't know what to do with my, with myself. So I, I like the constant lifestyle, but at the same time, um, as I get older, I think maybe that was when I was a little bit younger and a little bit more naive to everything. So now, now as I get a little bit older, um, I do like to have, have that off time and, and that family time set, set into my schedule. So outside of that, um, what are some of the things that you do that you're passionate about uh, outside of aviation and flying? So number one is um, I'm a percussionist. Uh, I've been playing drums since I was in third grade. My dad is actually a drummer. I was in the marching band in the drum line when I was in high school, and he was actually the percussion instructor. Uh, I play drums, I don't want to say every day because that'd be an exaggeration, but at least three times a week. I have an electric drum set at my house just to keep my neighbors from from hating me. Um, but yeah, I play, play drums, and that's definitely something that I love to do. Um, in addition, work out, uh, run. I love to run. I love to be outside. Like I said, even when I was a kid, just continued that passion to just be outside and go on hikes and, and explore, mm-hmm. I like to kind of go off the beaten, beaten trail and, you know, find like a, a waterfall or a stream or a river or something that, that doesn't have a path to it. You're staying busy. I am. Yeah. You're- I try to at least. <laughs> so from here in your military career, um, an opportunity came up. Yes. Um, an opportunity to potentially try out uh, for the 160th SOAR Regiment. Mm-hmm. Um, could you talk about kind of what that experience has been like? Sure. Um, so when I was still flying Apaches, we did an exercise in Dallas at Fort Worth. Um, as an Apache pilot, we went and supported the uh, 160th. I think it was a battalion sticks or something in the regards to that. They were doing some flight lead evaluations. And as an Apache pod, as a regular army aviator, I could not believe the, uh, the prestigious, first off setup of the planning cell that they had going on and how hardworking all of those, all those aviators are. It blew my mind. I, I was like, why aren't we like this? I I couldn't believe that this was, that it was part of, you know, army aviation, just a step above and just to see like how how much of expertise those pilots were and the in-depth planning and the briefing process it it was very awe like it was jaw-dropping to see and the day i came back i emailed the recruiter and i i dropped my packet i was like this is exactly what i want to do this this is where i i see myself and this is what i need to to do to advance my career and just to be around like-minded people that constantly want to better themselves and you know get the job done and be experts in their field so put my packet in a few months later got got some assessment dates and then i went to to assess Mm -hmm. i was still you know um i had just pinned captain I had, I didn't have that many flight hours. I think I had about 550 flight hours, which is pretty low to be assessing for the 160th. Um, I was a pilot in command and an air mission commander, um, and I had very low goggle hours, uh, which we only fly goggles in the 160th. So it's a little different because I was, I was flying the Apache and, and we fly the night vision system. So that was definitely a struggle in itself. But went to, went to the assessment week and, um, without like divulging too many secrets mm-hmm. because it's it's an experience for everyone mm-hmm. and it's something that everyone, whoever wants to assess, has to go through themselves. Um, but in a nutshell, the entire week is designed for you to fail. Mm-hmm. And really what they're just trying to see is your perseverance. Um, make sure that you can keep your head on your shoulders. Make sure that you can make uh, intelligent decisions and difficult decisions, especially under a lot of pressure and when you're completely exhausted. So I uh, made it through that week. And when I got to the final the final board process at the end of the week, just like West Point, just like that final board for uh, first captain, um, obviously much more intimidating. It was, um, I was, I was so tired. Like I couldn't really understand exactly what was going on in the room. Like I was, you know, getting bombarded with questions and intimidating people were asking me, you know, telling me how much I failed during the week and, you know, and making me feel like there is no way I'm getting into this organization. Um, Some mind and, games, right? Oh, a hundred percent mind games. And <laughs> and it worked too. I, I was convinced. I was like, I am embarrassed that I even tried out for like, why did I even come to, to try and prove myself? Because I am nothing. I am nothing compared to what, what those guys are. Um, but at the end of the board, the president of the board stood up and said, welcome to the regiment, welcome to the organization, and you'll be flying uh, Little Birds. And 
at that point, I, you know, a huge smile came on my face and, and I couldn't have been, you know, more proud and excited and, and glad that I pushed myself to come to uh, assess. At that point, um, as soon as the assessment was done, flew back to Bliss, went to the career course, and then immediately upon graduating the career course, started training for the 160th. Oh my goodness! So much happened in in that that short time frame. Yeah, it, it was pretty quick. <laughs> that that is crazy. I mean, um, just to go back a little, um, the training. Did you feel like giving up at all during that training? How like was it mentally and physically? How was it for you? How were you processing everything? Um. So I think. Some of the things that I've learned, especially throughout my career, um, and, it, and it's been a short career thus far, but kind of trying to um, like open up my um, perspective on things, mm -hmm. right? So not be so one track, one minded towards what's in front of me, but try and you know open up and understand you know the big picture behind everything. So I think with that in mind, going through what we call Green Platoon really helped. Um, I can not just motivate me, but like keep me pushing towards like the next check ride, the next phase of training, because I really wanted what was at the end of, of the training. And that was what I wanted to be like those pilots. I, I, I still do, you know, I want to be part of that organization that has, you know, saved so many lives that has done such incredible things for our country. And that like that big picture was what was the driving force. That's what kept you going. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, right around this time frame, um, was this 2018, 2019? Yes. So women had been introduced into combat arms. Mm -hmm. Did you experience um, any type of positive, negative type of experience because this is right around that time frame? Um, I don't know if there was... I can't think of a specific instance. Or, um, or even yourself, just kind of like knowing that that's out there. Did yeah, it affect you in any way? It it did to an extent. Number one, because being chosen to be the first female to fly the AH-6 mm -hmm. was, it, it was, I mean, a, an opening, a, a door opening, I guess, for, for other people to come and do that. Because I think what, what I've been able to do to be that first female to, um, you know, get through the physical part of the evaluation and, and prove that, you know, I can, I can work with the guys and I can fly the, fly the aircraft and everything. Um, now it's, it won't be weird when mm. other women come to assess and when other women get selected to fly, to fly the little bird. It, it definitely has been, especially for the individuals that have been in the organization for so long um, who haven't worked with with women in the cockpit with, next to them and, um, you know, the planning process and everything and just the work environment in general, it has definitely been a little different. And there's definitely some obstacles that are still being overcome in that aspect. But the thing that that I see that's that's very positive is now it's now it's not weird now it's mm. it's I'm just you know a part of the team part of the company and if another woman assesses and assesses favorably welcome to the team you know that's that's what's pretty cool about it so just to go back on a comment I made earlier um, I told you that in an interview six years ago you said that you wanted to fly Apache and you wanted to go to 160th yeah did you ever foresee this like carrying out six years ago and now you made it a reality um that that's a really good question i th sometimes i kind of like sit back and like think about my career and you know starting out at, even in high school and everything and for some reason i've just always had this like mind or this like voice in the back of my head saying like this is what you're going to do next and and that's just been one of those I guess they, it said, you're going to go to West Point. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. You're going to branch aviation. And that's the only thing I wanted. You're going to fly Apaches. And I flew Apaches. And then going into the 160th, it, it just kind of progressively has, I've always set goals like from a young age, I guess, um, from you know plenty of years before I actually at obtain that goal. Nothing in my life has been, not nothing. Things are sporadic for sure. But, but these big life decisions have always like, like you said, six years ago, I said, I wanted to come to the 160th and, and now I'm, I'm there. And it, it is something that I, that I do is set those goals from, you know, years before and set my sights on them so that I can actually set myself up to, to obtain them. Who inspires you and what motivates you? That's a good question. You got me on that one. 
I could have thought of that beforehand. <laughs> um, man, so many people. I mean, there's there's so many people that that inspire me. People that I work with um, in the company, um, in the one sixtieth. My, I guess, growing up, the one of the most influential people in my life would, besides my parents, would have been my grandma. Mm. She definitely inspired me to, you know, push through a lot. She was really sick with breast cancer and that's just what her, her drive and her, she was very, very strong. She, we didn't even know she had breast cancer. Wow. That's how like she would wear a wig. She didn't even tell us because she didn't want us to think differently. And I, I think that that had an impact on me, you know, just mm. keep driving, just keep pushing and, and do what, what, motivates you to you know continue your life and create that next chapter um so she was incredibly inspirational um my old company commander um captain alex sharkey if he ever sees this he'll make fun of me for (laughs) for bringing him up but but he had a huge impact on my aviation career um and then now when i'm while i'm in the 160th there i mean i could name every single person in the company just it they are incredible pilots and the expertise that they bring to the table, that they bring to the fight for the ground force that we support is, is unmatched. And every single day they, you know, they beat you down. They, they tell you that, you know, there's all these things to improve on and I love it. It's, it's great because yes, there are a million and one things that I still have to learn. Um, a million and one things that I have to improve on and, and they've mastered it, you know, and they, they won't ever say that they won't ever admit to that, that they are as, expert in their field as they are but yeah they're definitely incredibly motivating and inspirational um, as you continue to plan out what what are some things that you hope to achieve in these next coming years so that is definitely um a confusing part of my life because i i don't know exactly what i want to do next um i love where i am right now i love being in the 160th i love flying the little bird uh i want I'm thinking there's two different there's two different paths I can take. I can stay in the army um, mm-hmm. and continue my career. And if I do stay in the army, then then I would like to go as high as possible. I guess as high as I'm allowed to, not allowed to, but as high as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. Um, or I can continue, you know, my, the next chapter of my life. And I need to eventually have children uh, to to start a family. So it really it really depends. I really honestly don't <laughs> don't know exactly what I want to do next. When you look at your life up to this point, what do you think about your experience? Kind of every single achievement, every single obstacle that you had to overcome. Um, how do you reflect on that? So there are ups and downs. Um, with every high moment, there's you know ten low moments, and those types of things don't necessarily get highlighted in individuals' careers. So that definitely is something that you know keeps keeps you going i guess you can say um but i guess like when you overall reflect on everything i'm just i'm not done yet you know what i mean so it, to me it's just i'm i'm still so early in my career um the west point career was was great it set me up for you know what i wanted to do in the military but but i feel like still in the military like it's it's just the start it's just i'm i'm still pretty new um only having six years post graduation there's still there's still a lot of time to actually you know if make that change that i want to uh in a larger scale what is one piece of advice you give yourself um if you were to go through this all over again if i was able to, you know, see myself in the future and then give myself a piece of advice. I think honestly, it, it would be to relax a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very, very uptight with a lot of things, uh, nervous a lot, stressed out, like highly stressed out about, about a lot. So I think I would tell myself to kind of not just go with the flow, you know, stay, um, on top of everything, but be a little bit more of a relaxed individual and spend more time with with friends and family and not focus solely so much on on work and kind of keep that balance Mm -hmm. just because now i'm seeing it a little bit more how important that you know that at home time is because we are traveling a lot with this with the 160th so it's it's easy for me to say, oh, I just love work and I just want to be at work all the time. But now I have to keep that balance a little bit, a little bit more. So I would have started that younger and I would have kept myself a little bit more grounded and 
stress-free for for a big portion of of my career i think that's great advice um what advice would you give to young women who are aspiring to kind of um pursue a similar career path that you have Mm -hmm. or maybe break into something where um perhaps they may be a minority at this time yeah um I would definitely say it sounds cliche and I mean repetitive, but go for what what you love. Go for what you have aspirations for, because especially nowadays, like nothing is holding you back. There's there's absolutely nothing, especially in the military, where that that women cannot do. So if if you want to be an attack helicopter pilot, no one's telling you you can't do it. So just go for it. Uh, you know, you, you got to prove yourself. You got to be able to hold yourself to the exact same standards as the males. Um, you have to be, if honestly, if not better than the guys, because it is a little bit of a disadvantage, but, but there's nothing that will hold you back. So if you have aspirations to do anything, go for it. Whether it's, if you're a cadet and you want to go for a road scholarship, but you don't think that you're smart enough for it, that, that, it doesn't matter. Just apply and try for it. Like find a mentor, find someone that, that can help you get through that process and, and do it. I got, so we're almost close to the end here, but I got two questions for you. Sure. Um, West Point, how much has that shaped um, your, your, yourself today? Greatly, honestly. Um, especially through first year, see, seeing how timid I was hmm. from a new cadet into plebe year and my confidence level that has skyrocketed since then, it is... It definitely has changed me as a person. Um, West Point provides so many, so many different opportunities for cadets to to branch out and to learn new things and to uh, make new friends that they wouldn't have made friends with if they had gone to another school. You know, learned a new subject that they wouldn't that they wouldn't have found that passion for. And and I did the same exact thing. You know, just seek out those those new types of experiences. And then if you hate them, just just stop. Like West Point, it's so easy to just say, you know what, I don't really like that. So I'm gonna go and find something else that that inspires me and something else that that I have a passion for. So definitely, it had West Point definitely changed me for the better. And I ask this question um, with everyone that comes on the show, but what is your definition of success? And do you feel like you are getting closer or you've achieved it? So my definition of success is I don't think that it can ever be achieved. um, And I don't think that I have achieved it for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that success for everyone individually is different. Um, I think success is defined by um, happiness. I think that success is defined by family. And I think that success is defined by just, I guess it kind of goes back to like just the happiness, just a sound appreciation for what you're doing in the current moment. Because I think that there's a multitude of different levels of what an individual may consider success. So, I mean, I woke up this morning and still had you know, toothpaste left in my little travel tube, that, that could be, you know, that's a success. You know, I didn't, I haven't run out of toothpaste yet. So just little, little tiny things amongst your day can build to a greater overall appreciation for what you're doing at at the current time. And like I said before, I don't think that success is necessarily definable in one, in one way. And I don't think that it really can ever be fully achieved. Um, because you're constantly going to want to improve yourself and improve the people that you're working for um, and just making your life one step better each day. Nicely said. (laughs) Thank you so much, uh, Lindsay, for being on the show today. Yeah, Tom, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's, It's been awesome to be here.